So I've been in holistic practice since that time. I quickly found that the animals could be certainly made healthier or less susceptible to chronic disease and that their bodies had their own innate healing wisdom we could utilize in treating a lot of difficult illnesses. So what I try and do in my practice is honor where clients are at. The word doctor means teacher in Latin. That's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to present information to our clients to allow them to make informed decisions based upon their beliefs and their lifestyles. And that's what a doctor should be doing, not jamming things down people's throats, you know, in one way or the other. But um, obviously my passion is a more holistic approach to our pets' health care. That was such a beautiful invitation for us to become aware of as more and more people are we're getting skeptical or awakening to the COVID vaccine and that not necessarily being a one size fits all, despite what we were being told on the TV, it was also awakening a lot of people to the fact that this might be true for our animals as well. Well, hey there, and welcome back to Fire and Soul. This is a conversation that's really special and close to my heart. And if you're anything like me, a devoted fur mama, yes, I've got my Samson, my pup, and two kitty cats, uh, Leo and Pip. I want them healthy and happy and vibrant for as long as possible. And I imagine that you feel the same. And yet there's this epidemic amount of chronic disease and illness and suffering with real no answers out there or or easy to find, but they are. And so there's a lot of different pathways and remedies and solutions and incredible results that have been um, shared by my guests today on a couple of uh, other shows that I have seen in the past. And I feel so, so honored to get to drop in with Dr. Michael Dim to discuss all kinds of things, including um, preventative health care for our animal beloved companions, as well as vaccine alternatives and other type of medications uh, uh, to be looked at from a homeopathic, holistic lens, uh, as well as the vibrational and energy well-being of our fur babies. This conversation is going to educate you, enlighten you, awaken you, and hopefully inspire you to do things differently if you're not already. Um, and at the very minimum, I, I imagine there will be some deep resonance um, for you. And I'm excited to, to share this one with you. So let me share a little bit about uh, Dr. Dim. He is a holistic veterinarian of 33 years experience who stresses non-toxic alternatives for prevention and treatment of chronic disease symptoms in our animal companions, including vaccine alternatives and dietary, herbal, and homeopathic treatments, often instead of conventional drug treatments. And there's, if there's anything that we have learned over these past three, four years, it's that there are other alternative methods out there that will have us happy, healthy, and vibrant for a very long time, God willing. And so without further ado, please enjoy this conversation called Real Holistic Pet Health with Dr. Michael Dim. My name is Dr. Michael Dim, and I've been a small animal veterinarian for the past 28 years. Mm, yes. Let's look at those teeth. I graduated from Cornell University in the animal science program in 1986 and went into private practice. And I became quickly frustrated though, how the animals were never really getting well. They were always coming back with the same problems and often the medicine stopped working or the medicines made the animals sicker. But I was starting to see cancer and all sorts of autoimmune diseases in younger and younger animals, you know, puppies, kittens, very young animals that were sick and I had very little to offer them but suppressive medications or surgical procedures that at best gave them a temporary relief of their symptoms. And then suddenly my own two animals developed conditions. One of them developed a common thyroid condition and I have a medication that works to treat that condition. Within two or three days, I saw that he was jaundiced, yellow, his liver was shutting down, and it was the drug that was literally killing my dear kitty. Had another animal, she started coughing here and there. So we did some x-rays, and it turns out Misty has a condition called chylothorax, 
I had no other options medically or surgically to offer. I called the best surgeons in the country and they said, no, there's nothing we can do. I started to look for other modalities of medicine and I took a course in homeopathy in Virginia and I said, wow, this is a system of medicine that might be able to put my cat Misty's body back into balance. After I learned about nutritional supplements and homeopathy as a system of medicine, within four to six months, Misty went on to make a full recovery, was cured of this incurable condition. When I had these experiences with my own animals, I went and I said, I need to learn more about homeopathy and learned a whole other way of addressing chronic health issues in our animals that I hadn't learned about in my medical school training. And that's what led me to holistic medicine, which I've made the focus of my veterinary career in offering animals a gentler, healthier treatment option that truly addressed disease, not suppressed it or band-aided it, and offered cures at deep levels. A much more empowered, less fear-based approach to healthcare. Dr. Dim, it's so nice to have you on the show, especially because we've been corresponding for a few years now via email or on the phone. And so it's so nice to have you here and to finally meet you and put a face to the name and a man who's a true hero in, in this space. So welcome to Fire and Soul. It's great to be here. You know, I wanted to share with my audience, those of us uh, who are beloved and devoted for mamas and papas, um, and everyone knows how I feel about my pup Samson and my two kitty cats, uh, Leo and Pip, um, you know, during the, the height of the lockdowns and so much fear and paranoia, especially living in Los Angeles, it was August of 21, which was literally when I just sort of snapped, left my home in Santa Monica and went to go stay at my mom's. Right. Um, 40 minutes away thinking it would be for 10 days and it ended up being for 10 months. So there was some spiritual rehab that needed to happen. It just speaks to how intense these times were. But I, w I had already um, become pretty fanatical at listening to The High Wire with Del Bigtree and finding comfort that I wasn't alone in seeing what I was seeing. But then right. suddenly we had this episode that came out called Holistic Pet Care with Dr. Michael Dim. And I was like, wait, what? Of course. So I knew where he was going to go with it. But I devoured that episode and I probably shared it with everybody that I know and love. And, and so I just want to say that was such a beautiful invitation for us to become aware of as more and more people are we're getting skeptical or awakening to the COVID vaccine and that not necessarily being a one size fits all, despite what we were being told on the TV it was also awakening a lot of people to the fact that this might be true for our animals as well. So I wanted to start there. What was that like to get that call to come on that show? And then maybe we'll back into an introductory of how you came into this, this awareness to begin with. Well, I mean, I, uh, you know, I've, uh, I knew the producers of Dell show. Um, I had treated their animals virtually, um, holistically. And, uh, you know, that's how I was introduced uh, to him back in first 2019 and then uh, again in 2022. Um, my background is I'm a, a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. I graduated from veterinary school, conventional veterinary school in 1991. And um, I was, of course, thought that I was taught everything in medical school that I needed to know about in terms of uh, treating and preventing chronic disease in our patients. And, uh, you know, I quickly learned that I, that it wasn't something that I was taught very well. In fact, I was, I was maybe suppressing symptoms or relieving symptoms, but animals kept coming back for the same problems over and over again, or eventually they would come in for deeper health issues or side effects from the medications. And then we had to treat those with stronger medications. And so that, uh, you know, kind of got me thinking and, you know, I looked for other ways of approaching preventative health and treating chronic illness. And that's when I took a, a year long course in homeopathy back in 1997, 1998. And uh, at that time, I started to be amazed with a, a really gentle system of energy medicine that treats the whole patient's symptoms, not a diagnosis. And with that, along with uh, utilizing nutritional and sometimes herbal therapies, I um, I quickly found that the animals could be 
certainly made healthier or less susceptible to chronic disease and that their bodies had their own innate healing uh, wisdom that they, uh, you know, could could utilize, we could utilize in, in treating a lot of difficult illnesses. So, you know, so I've been in uh, holistic practice since that time. Um, I still do some conventional veterinary work, uh, stay, you know, kind of, um, you know, aware of those developments. But um, obviously, my passion is a more holistic approach to our pets healthcare. Yeah. And you, like me and so many of our listeners and, and viewers, are very devoted to your fur babies. And I remember hearing Absolutely. you hear a story of, I think it was two kitty cats, right? And uh, they were diagnosed and with some real, you know, chronic illness. Absolutely, and there yes. had to be another way after going through the homeopathic course. So can you share about that and that transfer? formative experience that really put you on this path as far as I was listening. Oh, well, yeah. One of my, we had two kitties when this was when I was married. Uh, one kitty was diagnosed with a thyroid problem, an overactive thyroid, and a common hormonal condition seen in everyday Western medical practice. And I started him on some medication uh, to treat it and common medicine. And then within a few days, I noticed that all of a sudden he's his gums were yellow and his ears were yellow and that he had become jaundiced. He had, his liver got very, very sick from, from the medication. So I had to rush him to the, back to the university of Pennsylvania. We went through the, the ER and uh, he was stabilized. And then I had to, you know, try to approach treating his thyroid condition from another perspective. At that time, I actually, didn't have any training in homeopathy. So I had to seek out a, a veterinary colleague and, you know, using single remedies over a period of time, he was able to, you know, overcome his thyroid condition and, and uh, recover from that severe illness uh, from the drug, from the medication, methimazole. Um, the other kitty cat that, uh, that I, you know, featured on the, on the video that, um, you know, kind of, kind of forged my interest in this was a kitty that developed a, a severe respiratory condition called chylothorax, which is a condition where the chest cavity fills up with uh, a milky white fluid. And most of the time, we don't know the cause in Western medicine. And at the time, uh, you know, there was no real treatments for it. I mean, surgery was an option to try and drain the fluid and to close off the leakage. But most of the time, the problem came back. So at that time, I did my own research and learned that there were nutritional and herbal therapies uh, using certain vitamins and bioflavonoids, uh, a supplement called Rutin, R-U-T-I-N. And within a short period of time, he was, uh, she was brought back to, to health. So, you know, those two of my own animals allowed me to really get jump started into, hey, you know, there's other ways of looking at, you know, preventative health and treating, you know, chronic illness like this. And, you know, and certainly, um, you know, that's how a lot of people find their way to holistic medicine is they're given either no options or their animals are getting sick from the medications. And, and then they, you know, are looking for other options. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, it, it, it seems to be very quiet out there. There isn't a whole lot of information. And in fact, even a quote, holistic vet, I just moved from Los Angeles where I lived for basically 30 years and, um, you know, to do like a little Google search bar for holistic vet, which we probably know better than to use the Google search bar. However, um, I, I came to realize very quickly that not all holistic vets mean that they're holistic. In Absolutely. fact, the two holistic vets that I, that I went to over the four years, once I, three years, actually, once I had really discovered your, maybe it was two full years. Yeah. Cause I, I found you in 21. Well, I left in 24. So it was almost three years. Yeah. Right. And so I immediately swapped everything, reached out to you actually, because I was worried about a particular issue. Samson, my pup was experiencing. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but I would walk into these vet offices and they were the exact same. They had the same protocols. They had the same diagnosis. They didn't have, if I even questioned whether or not I wanted to go a different route, whether it was something as simple as flea medication, much less a vaccine. It was like, they looked at me like I had a horns on my head. Right. So, right. So for those wondering how to find, you know, a real holistic vet, um, where do we, where do we start? 
Well, the first thing you want to do is there's a lot of people who call themselves holistic vets. You just, you know, you, you can even just go on their website or go in their waiting room and see if they, you know, carry the typical commercial pet foods, the dry kibbles and the canned foods. Um, you can ask them what their vaccine protocols are and, and that kind of thing. And so uh, a lot of these practices, they may incorporate, you know, Chinese medicine or homeopathy, but they're often using what are called, they call the best of both worlds, which obviously is a great statement, um, but they're usually going to the conventional model first yep. and then using homeopathy or, or, or acupuncture Chinese medicine as a backup. But, um, you know, so that's one thing that the viewers can certainly look for uh, in, in their veterinarian is just, like I said, look what their foods they're recommending, their vaccine protocols, go on their website, see, you know, what uh, what their primary recommendations are. Um, as far as finding a, a trained vet, um, there are several excellent organizations. There's the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association. Um, they're a very good group that's been around for many decades. Um, not every veterinarian that belongs to those organizations, again, follows, you know, certain protocols uh, or follows holistic medicine or as a primary, but um, certainly, a, you know, a lot of veterinarians who, you know, could be members of that organization. There's also the um, Pitt Karen Institute of Veterinary Homeopathy, which is, um, uh, I think, located in Portland or out in Oregon. And um, that's another organization um, that people can belong to, vets can belong to. So, you know, there's many uh, trainings that people go through now. There's a lot of different avenues. Um, and as I said, I, I personally go to what is their primary philosophy on, you know, preventative healthcare and treating chronic illness and what foods are they recommending to, to their patients? Yeah, that makes obviously so much sense because we're learning that about our own lives, you know. I mean, you have to be completely asleep and under a rock to to not know that we are being poisoned in our foods and our soil and the skies and right. virtually every, you know, area of life. And so we are having to take our lives and our healths, our health into our own hands, right? And become our own authority yeah. on this. Yeah. And so that brings me to actually something that I know I experience with a lot of my friends who say, I want that relationship, that connection, Michelle, that you have with Samson and, and my kitty cats. And I mean, I devote, I put a lot of love, a lot of time, a lot of nurturing into that. But I'm also like, I I, I, I do the research, I reach out, I, right. I, I listen to podcasts with people like you, I I swap vets, I'm willing to, to go the extra, extra mile. But where are some really good basic places to start? Like we talk about diet, obviously, environment I know is powerful and I want to get there, but what I'm trying to get at is this. There's a question in here, I swear. Um, most people are busy, highly distracted, have a million things going on, right? And then the pet has something serious that happens and it feels like an emergency. So, so the fear is up, the anxiety is up, and they just do what everyone does, which is take them to the vet. And the vet just says, here's the fix and you got to do this now. And it's like, if we haven't been able to be in this conversation have an, and have an awareness and a lot of people go to those sort of like, ah, it's the only thing that's being presented in the moment. But how do we start right. to talk about preventative care? And I know you talked about diet, but let's let's just even talk about like fleas, fleas, ticks, you know, mosquitoes. What are some ways in which if we just start there and we'll work our way up to vaccines in a moment, um, mm -hmm. what do you recommend that people can do when they're like, I don't know what to do about all this. I don't know. There's no other options other than these medications, whether right. they're digestibles or topical. And I can't do that for my animals. And I do want right. to share my experience um, from what I've learned from you in a moment, but I want to hear you offer some guidance on this. Well, I think uh, we spoke before we came on the air uh, off stage. Um, you know, one of the most important things is to, again, raise the vibration of our animals as best as possible, improve their vitality. And that starts with the preventative healthcare model that minimizes the use of those chemicals and drugs. So just because there are fleas out there or there are worms in the soil, doesn't mean that a healthy animal that is exposed to those things is susceptible mm -hmm. to those particular uh, parasites or worms. And so by raising the vitality of the patient or the energetic health of the patient and through herbal and functional medicine, 
we're able to actually lessen the likelihood that an animal is going to contract fleas or ticks or, or, or intestinal parasites. And so that's where it starts. So the basics of good health, of course, are, you know, fresh air, a lot of love, exercise, healthy food, you know, Hippocrates, the father of medicine, let said, let food be by medicine, let food be thy medicine and medicine my food. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, a tenant to certainly live by with our animals. So if we feed them a, a species appropriate uh, diet, which we can get into, um, and we minimize uh, toxins that we inject into them uh, via vaccines or chemicals, then those animals are going to be less susceptible to these things. So, you know, I often tell clients that, you know, I'll see in a, in a single animal, in a, in a single family household with multiple animals, there'll often be like one or two animals that are flea magnets and the other animals don't have any fleas on them at all. And then one animal will have a flea and be very, very itchy. So all of those animals have different susceptibilities. So what I try and do is, is to, again, raise the vitality of the individual patient, um, if not through these preventative measures alone, then through using energy medicines like homeopathy and, and again, herbal therapies to, again, improve the, the overall vibration, overall terrain of the patient. Mm -hmm. And that's always the goal of holistic medicine is to, is to improve the uh, terrain, you know, not worry about the outside invaders. So that's the ideal, obviously. Now that doesn't mean that there aren't, you know, certain, you know, situations where animals are not in ideal health and they're going to maybe attract uh, some of these things. Um, so with fleas and ticks, there are other options other than these powerful poisons that we put into our animals. There's uh, supplement, there's uh, essential oils, various formulas that have various essential oils in them. You know, I have my favorites that I've used over the years. Um, but there's a lot of good companies out there. Uh, there's, and you apply those to the animals. Uh, you have to do it, you know, on a regular basis because they don't have a long residual effect. Um, like a lot of the pills that we give and the topical medicines, they last for months on end. You know, so the with the essential oils, we have to be more a little bit more diligent with those. And then there's food grade diatomaceous earth, which is a, a natural way that can desiccate or dry out the fleas on the patient and prevent treat and prevent fleas that way. Um, ticks can be a little more challenging, especially in the central areas of the country and the northern areas of the country where ticks are are quite, you know, uh, quite uh, big. And so, you know, they can be challenging. So, you know, some animals are going to get some of these critters on them, but hopefully through a more holistic lifestyle, we're going to not see the tick-borne diseases and the Lyme disease and the anaplasma and the ehrlichia. Hopefully we won't see that in our holistically raised patients. Mm -hmm. You mentioned some of your, that you've got your favorite essential oils. Uh, what are some of those that you've seen be effective well, I've used companies that use kind of combinations with cedar and pennyroyal and other essential oils. Um, there's a good company called Wonderside that I've used over the years. They're they're a very big company online. Uh, one of my colleagues has developed a, uh, an essential oil line called Flea Hex, H-E-X. That's another yeah. really good one that I like very much. Um, and there's a lot of them out there. I mean, there's so, you know, with the uh, internet and, and uh, you know, there's, there's various you know, formulas that, again, will work uh, along with the preventative holistic uh, lifestyle for our animals. Yeah, yeah, very true. You know, speaking to that, after listening to that first conversation that I heard you have with Del Bigtree on the high wire back in August of 21, um, I stopped all medication for my two kitties and my pup, Samson, who was five at the four at the time, four years old. He right. was on that six month protocol. Right. And we know those brands. And, and ingesting that. And I didn't know any better. I didn't know any different, even though I hadn't been vaccinated. I don't think since I was born, like the first few shots and way back then it was way less than what it is now. So right. my parents definitely raised us with an awareness of absolutely none of that stuff beyond what was right. required at the hospital from the Navy way back. But, um, and um, I got to tell you, like I was in Southern California and I know that fleas and, and, and all of that is, it runs pretty rampant because it gets really hot out there, especially in the Calabasas right. area where I was. But none of my animals have had fleas ever since. One time, Samson, for like one week, got a little sort of in the crown of his head. And, um, and all I did was just put him in the bath. 
And that was it. And it was also during kind of a stressful time in our home. And, right. um, and so, and then I heard you later talk about the raising the vibration and making sure they're getting fresh air. And for us, we go to the beach or climb the, you know, the trails in the mountains and, and keep the music and just the vibe beautiful and peaceful and joyous in my home. And I know not everyone can do that, but I'm connecting these dots. And I was like, wow, we haven't had an issue for three years, really. Wow, it's wonderful. It is wonderful, yeah. actually, because I don't want to put anything into him that isn't all natural. I mean, listen, there's a time and a place for this kind of stuff, but but um, yeah, it's it's been a beautiful. Well, it's the it's the it's also the cumulative effect of all these toxins. So it's yeah. you know, if you put a dose of flea medicine on an animal, yeah, that animal can have an individual obviously reaction, but it's the month after month, uh, year after year use of these things that build up in the tissues, build up in the fat, overstress the liver and the detoxification mechanisms of the body, um, build up in the nervous system. A lot of these flea and tick medications are toxic on the nervous system and can cause neurologic problems like seizures and other behavioral changes in the patient. And so, um, you know, it does build up over time in the, in the individual animal, then you reach a certain threshold and then the animal all of a sudden start having a, an immune disease or an organ problem or a seizure. And people would say, well, I've been using that stuff for years and I haven't had any problems. Well, it's, again, it's the cumulative effect of, of them. Um, you know, so with the flea and tick medications, it's like any pesticide that's we're exposed to, uh, the effects do build up in the body over time. You know, if an animal comes into me loaded with fleas on them, you know, that those are a little more challenging to treat purely holistically when they're already infested like that. So in those cases, I mean, occasionally I'll recommend, a, you know, a, some short acting, you know, product to maybe, you know, clear the field and then start a more preventive approach. The preventative, I mean, the uh, essential oils or the diatomaceous earth approach, those, the, the, that approach will work in a flea infested animal, but people want relief when those, you know, when they have animals are loaded with fleas, it can take months and months to get on top of that. So, you know, there are isolated circumstances where I, where I have used um, those, those products short, you know, the ones that I call the, the, you know, the least poisonous of the poison, so to speak. But um, certainly though, we can get around a lot of, you know, of using these things by, again, keeping them healthy and, um, you know, realizing that they were not going to attract the fleas. They're not going to be susceptible. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, perfect. And I realize this is like a lifestyle, right? And it's just like exactly, a yeah. lifestyle. It's like, what am I ingesting? Not only putting into my body, but, but feeding my mind and this information sort of sickness society right. that we're in these days and how much time am I in nature and, you know, and stillness and all of that. So this is a, this is a, a real sort of holistic lifestyle, exactly, not only yeah. for our pets, but for ourselves. But I want to go into the sort of the heavier topics, or at least um, for me, it feels a little courageous and I, and I'm, I'm ready for this. Um, and that is to talk about vaccines for pets. And I've heard you say vaccinations in general are one of the most harmful medical interventions of modern science that has fooled most pet owners. And I've heard you say that, but then it's also really cool because Newsweek, about a year ago, September of 2023, they put out an article saying one in three dog owners refuse to vaccinate their pet due to conspiracy theory. Now, they were trying to debunk it, but the reality is, is that one in three, and it was getting a headline that like that, sure. and more and more people that I'm speaking to are like, yeah, heck no, am I going to just resort to that or go go there maybe even as a first case scenario. It's like just wanting to get more information, which is why I'm so excited to bring you here. But um, can we just talk about that and then a potential correlation? And if you can track this, amazing. Um, Dr. Zach Bush, are you familiar with him? Oh, sure. I, I okay. Remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Phenomenal human being. And, and this may have seemed unrelated at the time, but it, it wasn't. I was like, what? He's saying this too. We're seeing everywhere people say things like this, which is what he said on the Aubrey Marcus podcast in 22. He said that now more than one in two dogs are dying of cancer at half the expected lifespan, like for example, a golden retriever that might have 11, 12 years is a typical lifespan. All things considered, they're pretty healthy. They're dying now at five, six, seven years old, and it's just becoming accepted. 
And, and so he was, of course, connecting a whole bunch of other dots. But between learning from you, hearing that, seeing ads now where literally these pet food companies are saying dogs are dying, you know, at 50 percent less. And it's like, wait, this is now it can't become a standard while also so many of us are waking up. So there's a bit of a paradox happening, as, as I think I'm trying to paint the picture on. But clearly, you know this. So. There's got to be a question in there somewhere, but where can you expand on on what I'm really trying to to get us present to right now, which is this this it's not a mandate. This is not how it has to be. There are other there are other ways. Absolutely. And you started with, the you know, the vaccines and you mentioned Zach Bush um, vaccines uh, immediate uh, have been shown to disrupt the gut microbiome, you know, just like Zach Bush would talk about. And when you vaccinate animals, you you create an imbalance at the gut level. That's the first gateway to the immune system, the rest of the body. And then you end up developing a leaky gut, and uh, meaning that the intestinal lining is more permeable, the toxins from the gut. And then you get uh, absorption of those uh, toxins, and you get systemic immune diseases, whether it be in the you know, related to the skin or the or the digest or, or the uh, urinary tract or the nervous system or the hormonal systems of the body. So it starts with a healthy gut, and vaccines definitely hit the gut very, very hard. People often um, don't realize that. Also, animals are being injected with multiple components at the same time uh, in one shot, which is also a big no-no from a, a holistic perspective. Um, not to use multi-component vaccines um, and not to give those vaccines uh, month, there, again, year after year. And especially when these animals are young, when they're puppies and kittens, when their immune systems are uh, maturing, we don't want to be injecting them with uh, with these with these powerful uh, compounds and all the heavy metals and the adjuvants and the other components that go into the vaccines, the the you know the mercury and the the aluminum and and the rest of the uh, you know components that shouldn't be in a vaccine. So the vaccines probably again hit the body the most difficult. They're just the idea of injecting them bypasses the whole way that the uh, the body evolved to keep organisms out of the body. So, you know, if you wanted to develop an effective vaccine, I guess, you you know, if it was a, due to an intestinal virus, you would want to do an oral vaccine, but they're not done that way. They're given by injection. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, definitely vaccines, in my experience, I could spend hours and hours talking about vaccines, but they cause more autoimmune problems and and cancers than all the other components combined. And, you know, I've seen animals health just tank after just one shot. Um, I don't usually see that after an application of a flea or tick medicine or if an animal's on a bad diet for a brief period of time. But with vaccines, it's actually, again, just even a sensitive animal or a child, just one particular uh, vaccine can cause a lot of issues. Um, the other thing about vaccines also is, is again, um, what's been known immunologically, even if you believe in them, is, is that the immunity to certain core viruses lasts for years, if not the life of the animal. And that was and that that information, that research was published back in the 1970s by an immunologist by the name of Ron Schultz, who wrote in a textbook that that you know the immunity does last for certain core viral vaccines. And so he was adamant about that. And this was what 50, 50 years ago, and yet you know, veterinarians are still vaccinating animals every every year or every three years, which is way, way too often if you believe in the vaccines at all, which I personally feel that they cause more harm than they're worth. A gentle interruption to tell you about my upcoming women's spiritual business mastermind called Magnetic Creator that kicks off in February of 2025. More than half the seats have already been spoken for, which means that it just might be exactly the very thing that you have been calling in to your life. We ran Magnetic Creator all of 24. And so this will be our second year and it just gets better and better and better. If you have had a desire, you care deeply and bold visions of launching your gifts through offerings and invitations such as digital courses, programs, virtual retreats, workshops, um, books, podcasts, all the areas of my mastery. 
And I want that to be aligned, not only with your integrity, but also with the very reason that you are on this planet at this time, meaning there is far more, more depth and meaning to your vision now than possibly ever before, then this very well may be the perfect place for you to grow. So you will not only create, launch, market, and sell your invitations through my uh, proven formulas to the tune of helping thousands of others and, and generating over $20 million in revenue for my students and clients. But also we, we go much deeper because we have the foundation of a soul mapping that allows us to, to really get steady and, and rooted and present in that magnetic frequency that is our cosmic birthright. And we do that through working with the gene keys. And you know how much I love the Gene Keys and how much it's not only changed, but saved my life over this past year as I've been devoted to the contemplations and, and really learning this pathway of self-illumination that is a living transmission that activates our highest timelines. And all of the women that I've had the honor to work with over this past year, whether they are private mentorship clients or in my group masterminds, and certainly all the women who came in the first year of Magnetic Creator, this has been an absolute game changer to give us that sovereignty and that, that sense of, I'm going to stand firm in the embodiment of my truth, my gifts, and express this to the world so that I can be uh, yeah, met with that same energy from your dream clients, customers, and community. This is the journey and so much more that is happening inside the Magnetic Creator Mastermind. So if this has piqued your curiosity, by all means, come and check it out. Let's have a discovery call, a very easy breezy conversation to explore whether Magnetic will be an aligned fit for you, for me, and the highest and best for all. You can head on over to michelle-sorrow.com and check out Magnetic Creator Mastermind. It would be so beautiful to welcome you inside a discovery conversation. All right, back to the episode of Fire and Soul. Well, and then the rabies vaccine is now required in all 50 states. And, and, and I've heard you talk about this and I've definitely experienced this of pretty much all groomers, you know, doggy daycare facilities, you know, boarding, you know, right. uh, facilities, um, much less to travel, which is how I actually reached out to you for the first time is, you know, I, I needed, I needed, we needed to figure that out. Um, but, but how do we, how do we get around that? You know, these, if they're not even needed, like I gave a kitty cat a rabies shot, not knowing this was like 10 sure. years ago in Florida, in fact. And uh, when I was living there for just a couple of years, and he was just like, just a little itty bitty kitten, Leo, right. he's still with us. But his body went into seizures and convulsions for like the next oh. three days. And I was so terrified. And I mean, he would freeze like a, a, a like a, a frozen board and mm -hmm. he couldn't move. And it was horrifying. And yet these, these kinds of stories are so commonplace with people that I speak with. It's just like, yeah, he had a seizure or yeah. And the first thing I want to say is, were you recently at the vet? Because now I know, right? I've connected those dots. Right. I don't give, and I would never give, I'm just going to say it. I would never give a vaccine to one of my animals for anything. Certainly not a rabies vaccine because right. he had, when he was a puppy, and as far as I know, that's good for the rest of his life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, rabies vaccine, unfortunately, is required by law and by all 50 states. Um, the immunity lasts a long, long time after one or two, two boosters. There were... There was a study done many years ago called the Rabies Challenge Fund that showed that. Um, and uh, but yet the states want it every one to three years. And so some states will allow uh, what are called medical exemptions. I know Florida allows it, New York, New Jersey. And so if I feel an animal has a chronic health condition, um, I can write a or I feel an animal's at risk for a chronic vaccine reaction. I can write a medical exemption and, uh, you know, that's a legal, legally allowed. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up uh, about vaccines is, is that unfortunately most uh, physicians and veterinarians are not trained in what an, a vaccine reaction really is. They feel that if an animal doesn't have an anaphylactic or an immediate reaction in the exam room or within a short a few minutes after the vaccine's given, that an illness that develops in the days, weeks, or months later has no bearing on it. But the studies actually show the opposite. Um, certainly, as I said, vaccines 
trigger what's called autoimmunity, which is where the immune system attacks the body's own tissues. Mm -hmm. And studies back as early as the 90s um, by a veterinarian from Purdue, Larry Glickman, showed that the vaccines triggered autoantibodies against most of the body's tissues, you know, the connective tissue, the, the joints, the heart valves, um, you know, the DNA of the patient, which if you develop antibodies against your own DNA, you get mutations and new diseases. So again, vaccines have been shown to cause a lot of problems, encephalitis or inflammation of the brain, you know, which can lead to seizures. And it doesn't have to be immediate. It could be in the days, weeks, or months following it. So, you know, I want to just alert the listener or the viewer to, to that possibility. So the fact that your animal doesn't have an acute reaction in the exam room doesn't mean that that, you know, is not a risky uh, vaccine for chronic health. Yeah, well, it's not unlike what we're what we're learning, unfortunately, about so many people who, you know, went one way a few years ago and some others went the other way. But we're just seeing a lot of, you know, sudden reactions or adverse, you know, reactions. Right. And, um, some people can connect those dots. Many cannot. And uh, but if you're kind of halfway awake to this, you're you're really eyes wide open and. So, you know, learning about the medical exemption um, that you had talked about, that was one of the, the ways in which I was able to to get Samson to have, he had reverse sneezing issues at the time. And um, and so, and we we needed to be traveling, you know, back and forth. And of right. course, the airlines right. required these, these right. certificates of health. And so you were able to help us in a, in a very legit way. I felt good about it. You felt good about it. And yeah. medical airline didn't care as long as my pet was healthy and and um, <laughs> I'm glad you brought up like things like reverse sneezing and, you know, the symptoms of what we call in holistic medicine, vaccinosis are the are the chronic symptoms that come as a result of being vaccinated. So you actually see in the patient symptoms of the actual infectious disease that's seen in the wild. So with rabies, we'll sometimes see animals. A lot of times we'll see animals with neurologic changes that occur. Um, again, seizures obviously are a big one. But there's also behavioral changes, anxieties, fears, um, aggression, um, paralysis of the lower end of the body. So a lot of animals that are especially middle-aged and older ones, they'll develop increasing weakness or mm -hmm. spinal or lower joint problems in the weeks or months following the rabies vaccine. And you mentioned reverse sneezing, which, you know, throat spasms is a symptom of rabies. So some animals that are affected by rabies vaccine will actually have this reverse sneeze syndrome, which um, can be treated sometimes with homeopathy. So it's the chronic effects of these things on the life force of the patient that are most alarming and that um, lead to some serious illnesses in many cases. Well, and that brings me to another question that I have, because I haven't actually shared this with you in our private dialogues, but um Mm, let's see, maybe nine months ago, my pup Samson, who's a, a multi-generation Australian mini Labradoodle, for all intents and purposes, really, really healthy. However, he's got this thing that I was told is genetic. And I'm always mm -hmm. a bit suspect on the genetic type of diagnosis, but I'm curious what you would have to say. Um, uh, immune keratitis, where his immune system attacks his corneal gland. And at one point, I was told he was going to have to have surgery to have his eye removed. Wow. And this put me on the path to find yet another holistic vet who then couldn't treat it, got scared and said, I need to go see an ophthalmologist. So then I went and found like a really good one. I thought, looked mm -hmm. at all the reviews and I noticed that everyone, and this just speaks to the culture and I'm not judging this. I'm just speaking to the culture right. and this one thing to consider before I get to my question, and that is all the reviews. Yes, they had like 4.9, like out of five star, like hundreds of reviews. This 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 eye care ophthalmologist for, uh, for pets. But as I started to look at the reviews, they were all surgeries that had gone successful. Mm -hmm. That was why the, the humans were happy is that such and such doctor or so and so doctor, you know, diagnosed us with this and then gave us an incredible surgery and recovery. And I was like, wait, so you're super stoked and happy because you had a surgery and your dog no longer has an eye? Yeah, yeah. Wait, there's got. And so I walked into that office because I didn't really. Samson was oozing and pussing mm -hmm. and his eye had completely closed. And this was like three days or four days into the most severe symptoms. 
a reaction or whatever was happening. And I just said, I need to be very clear. I am not having surgery. So don't even recommend it. And I mean, I was just right. so firm and I know that it was a little startling and off putting in the whole thing. And I said, no, honestly, like there has to be another way. And I will only go that route. And if you cannot have this conversation with me in our consultation, then I need to go somewhere else. Sure. And so interesting, we were able to get him back to normal, but it was through uh, steroids and it was through what they wanted him to be on forever, which was a drop on the daily. Mm -hmm. I actually didn't do that. We got him to like, I got him recovered through mm -hmm. yes, steroids, but then that's now been since May and he hasn't been on anything since. I don't know though, will this show up again? He's got the cloudy eye and I'm just curious. I know this is a very specific case to me, but since I've got you here, what do you know about immune keratitis or genetic disorders in general? And um, and or any sort of like remedies that you could recommend for that specifically. Well, I mean, you know, that's a what we do in homeopathy is we look at the whole symptom picture of the patient. So that requires an extensive interview of the mental, emotional, and whole body physical symptom tendencies. Because when the body is sick, as a, in a part of it, it's sick as a whole. It's never sick in in parts. Mm -hmm. So even though you're even though the diagnosis was the immune keratitis, um, we still look at the whole symptom picture on a mental, emotional, and physical level and coming up with a homeopathic regimen over time to hopefully treat that tendency and lessen the susceptibility to, to recurrences. Um, with that being said, you want to avoid, which I'm sure you're going to do, avoid the triggers of autoimmunity like vaccines and poor diets and you know some of the flea and tick medications and that kind of thing that uh, leads to an autoimmune response. But certainly they're, you know, from a you know, an herbal perspective, there are some nice uh, herbs that can be used uh, orally that are beneficial for eye health. They really won't treat the tendency, though. They'll kind of, again, treat the symptoms when they occur a, a little less, you know, suppressively than the steroids, which is why I always go with homeopathy as a, as a system of medicine to try and address that. But, you know, there are herbal formulas. There's a a nice store down here in Florida that has some herbal blends that I use. I have a nice healthy eye formula that uh, from my paleo pet here in South Florida, very good store that ships all over the country. And that's got some very good herbs in there that are excellent. There's also a colleague of mine here in Florida that has, um, uh, uh, you know, a, an eye, an eye line of products called OcuGlow, mm -hmm. which you can also find online, which has some, you know, very good herbs in there for ocular health. Um, whenever there's an immune keratitis uh, of the eye or a dry eye or an autoimmune disease of the eye, usually it means that the liver is probably toxic to some degree. In Chinese medicine, a lot of, you know, uh, eye diseases from cataract, autoimmune eye inflammations uh, of the cornea are due to liver imbalances and from to from prior toxicity. So putting an animal on a good liver detox and that has a tendency to eye issues is another good idea. Um, mm -hmm. So there are good, er there are certainly some good herbal uh, detoxes. And again, trying to treat the patient from a, what we call a constitutional perspective homeopathically. Yeah. Yeah. So, so good. You know, and I'm thinking about that time, it was the same six week period where I was, uh, I had to travel quite a bit. It was earlier this mm -hmm. year. And it was the same time he got the fleas on the crown of his head. So there was wow. stress going on, to say the least. And I was trying to figure out, am I moving to Mexico? Am I moving to Texas? <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. So, and they were feeling it. You know, I'm sure all my fur babies were feeling that. So right. I'm just connecting the vibrational well-being of, of him as well. But good to know about the, the liver detox, which brings yeah. us to food. So I, you've brought it up many times, and I've been excited to circle back to you because I think there is, there's a lot of confusion and even concern. I know that you're a big fan of, of the, you know, protein appropriate, rotating protein, raw food diet. Um, but there's also concerns about, you know, the quality of meats these days. Absolutely. And so, oh my goodness, yeah. there's so much for us to think about. However, it's worth it if we just figure this out, but, but, but where do you, where do you start or where do you recommend we start with, with becoming aware of what our animal needs to be eating if provided we've got our small animals, dogs, cats, and, you know, pocket for babies? Well, there's, there's certainly a lot of, you know, 
literature on how to do it. You know, Dr. Pitcairn, my teacher in homeopathy, has a book. Although I will, without getting into it, we'd probably spend a whole hour on it. Uh, he gets into more because of the problem of the meat supply in our in, in, for us and our animals, um, as well as the way animals are raised to be meat. You know, for us, um, he has some vegetarian options in there in his in his latest edition of his book. You know, so some clients will use that. That's not what they really evolved to eat. I mean, their teeth are you know they're carnivores, but um, he has still some of his original recipes. That are in there. There's a, another veterinarian named Ian Billinghurst who has a book called original book was called Give Your Dog a Bone. And <laughs> there's been there's been many other uh, books written since then. So there's certainly plenty of um, you know plenty of literature out there now on how to do a, a species appropriate diet at home. And now there are there are increasing companies that um, uh, are coming out with you know raw meat diets that are balanced that are already packaged. Um, back 20, 30 years ago, you had to do it yourself and follow recipes. But now there are, you know, there are certainly some excellent formulations. And I try to find meat supplies that are pesticide free, hormone free, human grade meat. Um, uh, my friends down here in Pompano, again, they have some a really good, you know, raw meat supplier that uh, ships all over the country. So What's they're the name of that company? Uh, my Palio Pet. You know, oh, good. Okay, same yeah, friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah same thing. And um, you know, there are several others. I mean, out there, raw meat companies. There's one called Steve's Real Food. I love some, them. Which some of my clients have used. Uh, there's another one called Darwin's. Um, there's so many of them now. You, I can't even keep up with them. Um, you know, I, I tend to stick with my preferred few. I mean, uh, the other thing about it is. You know, you want to try a, a certain way of feeding your animal, uh, it, the, the principle being a minimally processed, fresh meat, preferably raw diet. Um, and if your animal doesn't do well with one approach, like, for example, if you follow the Pitcairn recipes and they're not doing as well, then you can switch to, you know, to another uh, philosophy of fresh, fresh feeding. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, philosophies on it. I mean, the the purest raw meat diet would say, you know, we want to feed our animals mainly raw meat, bones with uh, organs and limited vegetable material. You know, that would be with minimal carbohydrates. Uh, that would be the kind of the prototypical barf diet or species appropriate raw meat diet. Um, so, but like I said, there are other versions of it. Some recipes include some grains in there. I'm not I, you know, a lot of my raw meat people are, you know, big anti-grain, you know, people for our animals. And, you know, um, certainly grains and undigested grains and processed grains and kibble create inflammation in the gut and inflammation in the body. So probably feeding processed grains isn't a very good idea. But um, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, again, philosophies and options out there. And you just, just like us, you want to pick what works for a given person. Not every person the ideal diet. I mean, uh, there's no ideal diet for every single person. You yeah, know? exactly. Kitty and you want to rotate the proteins because if you, yep. if you feed the same protein day in and day out, you're more likely going to develop allergies or hypersensitivity, you know, to, to the ingredient. It's the opposite of what my conventional vet colleagues say, where they say, well, you know, you got to feed the same thing. And if you, and if a client says, well, if I feed my animal diet, if I keep with diet A, they're 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 fine. And I switch to diet B, they get diarrhea right away. That's a, not a healthy gut, and that animal needs to have work with a holistic vet to work on the health of that gut. And so it's it's the animal that thrives on a variety of proteins that lessens the likelihood of allergies and sensitivities developing over time. Mm -hmm. So kitty cats too, the raw food diet. Absolutely. Sure. In fact, I'm glad you brought up kitty cats because the one of the, the worst thing, the, the biggest take home point for people with kitties, the worst thing that anybody could do for a cat is to feed kibble. Um, okay. Dry kibble is by nature, mostly processed, heated, carbohydrate based proteins and um, feeding carbohydrate based proteins to a cat um, who are obligate carnivores 
tr- puts tremendous stress on their whole body, uh, mm-hmm. you know, evolutionarily. It it leads to makes them have to drink more water than they're accustomed to. Cats should get all of their moisture from their food, not from uh, not from drinking because they're not very efficient water drinkers. And so when we feed them mainly, a lot of people feed kibble. They think it's good for the teeth, which it's not, you know, mm-hmm. because processed carbs lead to decay of the teeth. Mm-hmm. And so feeding cats kibble or carbohydrate-based foods leads to dehydration, often premature kidney disease, which is the number one cause of chronic illness in middle age and older cats, mm-hmm. urinary tract disease like crystals and blockages, um, as well as uh, diabetes and obesity. So definitely cats, we want to be mindful of uh, what we feed them. So you know, kibble and processed canned foods are not the way to go. I'm so glad that you said that because I I definitely didn't think about the kibble for the kitty cat because I got caught up in like, oh, this is the healthy one. I go to like the the healthy pet, you know, supply store. And and so I'm literally when we finish this conversation, I'm going to go and get them some raw meats and 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 get rid of the kibble because, yeah, my elder cat, she's almost 15 and she drinks so much water. So clearly that's what's going on. I'm glad you brought uh, it. Getting cats on, I'll never forget, I brought up, we brought up my original cat uh, that got me into holistic medicine, the, the Persian that had the thyroid problem. Um, I'll never forget when I learned about feeding raw diets to animals, I uh, we prepared raw meat for a raw meat recipe for our cat and we put it down. He looked at us like we were crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Cats can be a lot more challenging to get on to a raw diet. Um, they, the pet food companies are very clever. They have all sorts of flavor enhancers and and enhancements in the food that hook them, just like McDonald's or Burger King hooks our kids, you know, with with flavorings. And so cats can be very challenging to get off kibble and processed foods. And so it takes time. There's an excellent book called The Natural Cat. Um, And I I like to give a a call out for her because she and I have been working on cases together for decades. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a book by Anitra Frazier. Um, F-R-A-Z-I-E-R, Anitra, A-N-I-T-R-A. She's, you know, in her 80s these days, um, but she was out there back in the 70s preaching species-appropriate diets. Her book is excellent as a resource. I also work with her individually with some of my clients to, as a coach to mm-hmm. get cats off of the raw, uh, off of the kibble and onto a raw diet because it, it can take time and, and a lot of patience, but it's critical for the health of, of our cats, just like it is for you know, for the dogs. Okay. So maybe then before I go and buy a whole bunch of raw food for the kitty cats, go get the book first. <laughs> or, or give her a phone or give her a phone call. You know, I can offline give you, I mean, I can give you a phone number. I, I, what I do in my, in my consultations, cause I don't, I'm not, uh, I usually refer kind of some of the, the food coaching to a couple of my colleagues um, in terms of processes of getting animals uh, adjusted. But um, Anitra is in her eighties now. She lives in New York. She's still, works with people across the country and by phone. And, Amazing. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I would, I'll get that information from you when we are, I know yeah. that we're about to wrap up and I just have a couple more questions. This sure. is mm-hmm. it's been so good. Um, I want to actually go back to a couple things because I know I'm concerned and I, and I hear this everywhere and I'm in the middle of the country now, rattlesnakes and mosquitoes or just snakes in general. So everyone's like, you've got to get your dog vaccinated against the mosquitoes. You've got to absolutely get your dog vaccinated against snakes, no matter what your philosophy is on, on vaccines, you know, in general. And of course I haven't, um, but I am curious, what are your thoughts around, first of all, prophylactic ivermectin, maybe for the mosquitoes. I've heard that could be potentially good. Obviously maybe some dosing in there would matter, but also what about snakes? And what are your Uh, thoughts around that? Well, with snakes, I mean, that's where homeopathy can shine too. When you get a snake bite or a a snake, you know, uh, injury or, you know, even from a a venom snake, there are anti-venoms now that the emergency clinics have. Um, I am not as experienced with the vaccines that are available for some of the snake, uh, you know, snake toxins, but homeopathy is a wonderful system of medicine and has a, a, a tremendous number of remedies that were actually developed from snake venoms that are actually used to treat mm. actually exposure to snakes, uh, to snake venom and snake bites. So that's another reason to consult with a homeopathic veterinarian, you know, to, to kind of approach it from that, from that angle. Um, as far as ivermectin, I mean, you know, um, you're talking mainly about heartworm, I guess, is that what you're concerned with? Uh, yes, heartworm. You know, I heard that the mosquitoes cause heartworm and, yeah. you know, other issues. 
Well, I know we're at the end. Of, again, we can maybe do another show. On maybe, <laughs> but, you know, heartworm disease, um, again, uh, one of my colleagues wrote a book many years ago called Vital Dogs Don't Get Heartworms. Mm -hmm. Dr. Falconer wrote that book. And, and he practiced in South Texas at the time. And none of his clients were on, you know, heartworm prevention, and he wasn't seeing heartworm in, in, in animals. And so, again, back to what I said in the beginning, holistically raised animals tend to be much less susceptible to these things. So, I, you know, there are herbal alternatives if people are nervous about these things. There's herbal formulas for heartworm prevention and treatment that have black walnut in it and wormwood and quassia bark. These are different herbs that are very effective for preventing, you know, parasites and, and heartworms. So, but um, I don't worry too much about it, but with ivermectin, which is the main ingredient also in the conventional monthly preventative called HeartGuard, which has been used for decades, um, one dose works for two to three months. Mm -hmm. So if a person wants to use ivermectin or, or conventional heartworm medicine, you don't have to give it every month like my colleagues recommend. You can do it every two to three months. And you're giving much less pesticide if you do the math over the months and the years. And also in two thirds of the country, heartworm disease isn't even transmitted um, most of the year. The average temperature has to be 65 degrees or higher for 30 consecutive days for mosquitoes to transmit heartworm disease. And that's just not occurring in central and northern parts of the country most of the year. So people are using these preventatives year round. They don't need to. And they're combining these preventatives now all in one. They got the heartworm, the flea, the tick. Mm -hmm. They're super toxins and they're being given month after month and year after year. So a less is more approach is always best. And what I try and do in my practice is honor where clients are at. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're all on our journey at a different point of evolution. And so I try to really, in my philosophy of practice, I honor if a client is still somewhat in the fear-based conventional model of medicine and, and at least preaching or getting them to go on to a less is more approach, you know, not giving them dogma. Um, you know, I try to give them the information. You know, it's good for me to close on the word that the word doctor means teacher in Latin. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to prevent, present information to our clients to allow them to make informed decisions based upon their beliefs and their lifestyles. And that's what a doctor should be doing, not jamming things down people's throats, you know, in one way or the other. Well, you and I both know there is no money in a healthy pet. So there is that. I feel like we need to have another conversation because I want to go into the spay and neutering and all yeah, kinds of Yeah, we didn't get a chance to get in. And aggression, I know you were concerned. Oh, yeah, yeah, aggression. Okay. Well, okay, real quickly then on that one, the aggression. You're seeing a lot of aggression in the young pets. And I and I was asking you, are you seeing that also because humans are more aggressive? They're more scared. We've got PTSD. Right. And, all that, and you're like, absolutely. Yes, there's a connection. Again, the absolutely. vibration in the home and the one holding the, the top of the leash, that energy absolutely. goes down yeah. to the animal. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, animals are, you know, like what we call psychic sponges. They take on the mental, emotional imbalances of the guardian. But, you know, aggression, you know, has all has the factors that the same things we spoke about in the beginning of the show is, again, the, the overuse of the vaccines, because vaccines cause a low level inflammation of the brain, and that can lead to behavioral changes and aggression. Um, early spaying and neutering, which we can get on to in another show, but um, removing sex hormones, especially when they're younger, you know, can have a tremendous deleterious effect on the behavior of animals. It's the opposite. You know, people say, well, I neutered or spayed my animal to calm them down. But actually, fear-based anxiety and aggression is is actually increased in the neutered or spayed animal. Um, so, and then removing those sex hormones plays a tremendous role in other autoimmune diseases of the endocrine system. We see more thyroid problems, adrenal gland problems, diabetes, cancer, all of that is increased in the surgically sterilized animal. So, um, but to get to your original the, the question is, is about aggression. Yeah, the sex hormones play a play a big role. It's the opposite again of what we've been told, you know, by the establishment. I mean, yeah. we just continue to awaken more and more and more and more. It's an exciting time. Thank you for being an integrity-filled teacher and a man on a mission who is sharing such beautiful wisdom um based on your 33 years of experience and you know, as as being 
yeah, um, an evidence-based doctor in this space. So thank you. Where can people reach out to you if they want to book a consultation or have a conversation with you? Yeah, they can, go, they can go to my website, which is drdim.com. That's D-O-C-T-O-R-D-Y-M.com. That has all my uh, contact information. I believe it has the the uh, the appearance on the Big Tree Show. Um, has how my practice works, and I usually answer emails within you know within a quick period of time. So, you know, I welcome consultations. I have clients all over the country. I've done international consultations. So, um, you know, with holistic medicine and homeopathy, we don't always have to see our patients to to do an effective job. And again, a lot of it's education too. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's the thing is we get trapped into thinking we have to do these sort of, you know, these consistent checkups that just really look for problems. I mean, I totally right. get have an overall general idea of our health, uh, of our pet. But yeah, um, thank you so much for coming on Fire and Soul and for sharing um, all about this. And thank you again for sharing your wisdom with us today. I so Absolutely. appreciate it. <laughs>